Welcome to the On Point Podcast, a channel dedicated to helping you be the best hunter you can be. On Point is designed to help motivate and inspire you to get more out of yourself and your gear during your next hunt. If you're looking for information that will directly impact your success and help inspire you to go on new adventures, whether you're hunting with a bow or a rifle, On Point is the channel for you. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the podcast. Brad Luttrell from the Go Wild app and the Restless Native podcast and I talk about a couple social issues with the hunters community right now that are going on with the baboons thing where a hunter posted a picture of a small troop of baboons and there was a baby baboon and a couple other mature baboons and that caused an uproar on the social media and on the news and stuff. We cover that and we also cover a kind of a debate about public lands and having secret spots on public lands and saying that no one else can go in there. It's your spot. You, you, you blow other people out of there. And you know, also what should be the etiquette and what kind of ethics go along with having secret spots and expectations for showing other guys your spot. What do you kind of do there? It's kind of an unwritten code or unwritten book of uh, don't take other people to my spot if I show you or don't go there without me. And everybody kind of has their own code. Well, we cover all that stuff as well as dive into some new features that the Go Wild app is coming out with here soon, which is really exciting. And made for a really good episode. Brad had some good points. And uh, I thought we were going to be a little bit more different on opinions. But it turns out we were really uh, very similar on a lot of our views. And I uh, really enjoyed our conversation. So, as always, guys, I'll see you at the end of the episode. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. I think, we're, I think we're a couple years out starting that journey. Yeah. Once you go down that path, things definitely change. <laughs> So, well, I want to thanks, thank you for coming on to the show, Brad. I, I know you're a busy guy, and, and both of our schedules kind of just magically aligned for this last minute podcast. But I, yeah, I, I'm never able to book one this last minute. It just kind of worked out. <laughs> well, this this thing I wanted to go over um, is I think you probably listened to the Rogan podcast too because I you seem pretty well. You knew exactly what I was talking about when I said that conversation between Dudley and Rogan. Yeah, and uh, I'm like, man, Rogan's on the wrong side of the fence, and then you posted. <laughs> You posted that thing on Go Wild, um, and for folks that don't know what that is, that's that's your app that you have. Yeah. And uh, it's like a – I say – I was talking to Cody from Born and Raised about it tonight. I'm like, dude, it's like a Instagram slash Facebook for hunters, and stuff doesn't get censored off there and stuff. And, and um, I was just kind of throwing a plug to Cody for you. <laughs> but Yeah, thanks. I always appreciate uh, free advertising. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, I, I'm a big fan of your app, man. So, But I saw you post on there, and and it was a little bit different view than what I definitely had. And then um, Cody uh, from the Rich Outdoors podcast kind of had a different view. And then it kind of – and it was, it was totally friendly, everybody on there. And that's the thing about Go Wild so far is I really hardly see any negative on there. Um, so it was actually yeah, even a really good people... conversation with multiple perspectives. And yeah. uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I'm like, we need to do a podcast on that. And then the next hot button right now, which is that baboon fiasco with that guy from Idaho, um, which we can hit on too. But I really wanted to focus on the public lands because I feel like you and I probably have a better idea what's going on there. Because I don't know what the heck really happened with the baboon thing outside of a, you know a picture got out and then it didn't end very well. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I think there's lessons to be learned there, even if you don't know what happened. Yeah. That's, that's more of, you don't necessarily even need to know the whole story. I mean, uh, I don't know Blake. I mean, I know we have some mutual friends that, that know him and I, I'm sure he's a stand up guy. Um, uh, it's, it's more around just always thinking like any photo you take, you should assume the world's going to see it. I've that's heard what that. it comes down to. And, and, and beyond that, you know, I think, a lot of hunters defended the photo, um, where where it the, it's really the commentary, the alleged commentary. I'll say that because I haven't even seen the email itself or anything. Um, are we recording? Is this going? Yeah. We're going now. Yeah. All right. So I, we should back up. Are, for, if we're, are we jumping into baboons? Or are we going to do public lands? Because um, I'm, I'm getting ready to go like deep into baboons. <laughs> we kind of just dove into the baboons here. I don't. I feel like the baboons is going to be much quicker than the public lands. So let's just let's just dive okay. into it. Let's just keep going. 
Okay, so, so to set this up for people, uh, yeah. what what I think and what I've heard happened, and, and this is, I've read a little bit about it, I've not had as much time to read on it, uh, to be an authority, and I don't know him, again, I don't know him, but what it sounds like is he went on a very legal hunt, mm-hmm. um, hunted several different African species, and uh, I believe he was with his wife, and was gone for a while, and came back, proud of his hunt, and shared it with a group of people, right? The commentary that came out was that he he said I shot a family of baboons. Like there's a quote in there, and like in context, it might have even you know just let's just assume there's some type of context where that sounds okay. What happens is people dial into stuff. You know, you're always you should assume you're always going to be in a sound bite, um, which is really hard to do. I mean, if you think about like all of your daily communication, you're always a screenshot away from being on CNN. Yeah, that's the world we live in, right? Um, so, so when you think about you know the, the context of having a photo of a lot of baboons stacked together from this hunting trip, I mean, trophy photos alone, man, it's like that. I I think we're gonna we're gonna hit a point like you're already seeing this get more and more saturated with you know right now it, it was Cecil the lion, yeah, and then and then it was the giraffes. Well, now it's bears, and it's like how how far down the line. Are we? Is it going to be that this outrage culture dives into our hunt, hunting culture? You know, I mean, uh, white-tailed deer aren't as attacked right now, but they're out there. I mean, I've been posting on the Go Wild account on Instagram, which grew to, I think we're at 50,000 followers on Instagram. Mm. Those bigger accounts like that quickly will get a... Uh, a reach that is not possible from a regular hunter and they're going to hit those anti hunters very quickly when, when something goes viral. So I've had people give us death threats over deer, really a deer. I mean, these things kill 200 people a year. They're over significantly <laughs> overpopulated in areas and people will send death threats because you shot Bambi. So I, th- you know, at, thinking on the outrage culture, like you, it, with something like I shot a family of baboons and with that photo, it again, may be totally legal, maybe within your right to do so. And yes, you maybe have shared it to a private email, mm-hmm. which I've heard is a hundred people. seems like a lot. I don't, I don't know a hundred people that I would want to send a, a hunting photo to, but that aside, like I'm really not judging the fact that he went, that he hunted. It's just, and, and I'm really not, not even the, like the commentary, but the lesson here is that like you should always just be on your best game for for being a PR advocate for hunting. Yeah, and I think the position that he had too cuz I I understand that he was a employee of the Idaho Fishing Game and that a lot of folks are, are being, you know, saying that he was being held up to a higher standard. Was the commissioner, wasn't he? I I think so. I think so. And well, we should have that fact straight, but I, Yeah, I, uh, you know, and and I, I pretty much agree total hard, total, total heartedly with you, but unfortunately, and I've said this on prior podcasts, is that's the world we live in. You know, guys shouldn't have to hide what they do, and and these guys that want to take you know these grip and grin photos, which is there's nothing wrong with that. But if you are wanting to prevent yourself from maybe getting hammered in the future online, then and portray hunting in the right, I mean, there's a big difference between a baboon and a deer. To me, there is, right. and no, I know what I have taken that photo. No, I, 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 I was there, you know, in April. I had the opportunity to shoot a million baboons. Right, <laughs> they're everywhere. And for folks that don't know, so I'd like to think I could speak semi intelligently on this. Is you know, baboons are assholes. <laughs> they, <laughs> they really are. My my guide, uh, the private hunter, uh, where we were at in Namibia, was in a war with a troop of bab- <laughs> of baboons that lived within a mile of his house. And I guess he says he shot one of the uh, leaders of, <laughs> of the troop. And then since then, they've been coming, vandalizing his house and stuff. And they've broken inside. And the, the roofs are made of, like, the straw material. He, they rip the roofs apart. They throw poop on the windows. They walk on, you know, they just do all sorts of things since he killed that one baboon. <laughs> and, uh you know, farmers, you know, if you have like a, uh, a lamb that gives or a lamb and they're, I don't know what a female sheep is that whatever it's called that gives birth, but a mother lamb or mother sheep, they'll kill that mother sheep just for the milk and just suck the milk out of it. So, hmm. I mean, they're, they are very, very hard on livestock, um, uh, very hard on other animals in the area. They're like my, my guide said, if you're within, cause this guy, I believe he shot him with a recurve, which is amazing in itself. Um, 
uh, my guy told me if I get within 100 yards of one, head the opposite direction because that is very dangerous. And uh, it was just really, really interesting that the perspective that the folks have over there, I'm sure everybody over there was like, yeah, kill 16 more. You know, like these things are horrible. They're pests. They're they're like our yellow jackets, you know, like get rid of them. Right. And uh, but posting that photo again, it was private email. But like you said, you need to act like the whole world's going to see it. I think that's probably probably pretty, pretty darn good advice. Hindsight, especially for him. But uh, yeah, man, I mean, you're, n- you're not going to get the benefit of all the context you just gave. Like, you don't. When does that ever happen? Like with lions, you and I both know the benefits of hunting lions. It's honestly better for the lions to have to be hunted mm-hmm. because that gives them value areas that stopped hunting lions. The lions vanish from from poaching. I mean, like right. hunting, hunting these animals gives them value on the trophy sense. And, uh, you know, but you're not going to get the, the time to explain that. People see that photo and you're done. Like you're, you're absolutely done. So uh, I just had Olivia uh, Oprah on my podcast, extremely intelligent person when it comes to hunting in Africa and um, like a, just a wealth of knowledge. And, and she was talking about, you know, elephants. I mean, elephants are our kids, you know, um, I mean, my kids probably got a stuffed animal up in his bed right now of an elephant. It's like what they grow <laughs> up with. It's, it's the culture yeah. that we raise our kids to almost idolize these African animals. So, uh, you know, when, when people see a stack of dead baboons, it's like a stack of dead little Rafikis from the line. I was going to say, I mean, yeah, they, they like immediately. <laughs> yeah. It's like you immediately associate with something that it is not. I mean, right. you, you're talking about it being a problem animal and, uh, you know, Olivia's telling me about these elephants and talking about how they just completely decimate crops yep. and how, uh, actually in the certain parts of the world, they're extremely overpopulated. I believe one, uh, one region she, she had hunted, the saturation was ideal at 60,000 and they're at 200,000 elephants. Seriously. I mean, that's, that's the size of a uh, something the size of a garbage truck running around and you've got a surplus of a hundred I'm really bad at math. That's 10 times 000. the population of the town I live in. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> That's a lot of so uh, but, but the thing is, do you think if you posted a long, long caption about conservation and Wouldn't how matter. you're doing, yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's strange times, man. We live in strange times and uh, social media in a lot of ways has made hunting more accessible. I think it's given people, um, you know, say what you will about Cam Hames. People seem to really love to hate him or, or what have you, but the dude has half a million people tuning into his messaging and he's done a lot. And Joe Rogan, these guys that yeah. are celebrities have done a lot that we benefit from people like that. But we also, you know, when, when situations like this happen, it, social media is what made your trophy, your grip and grin. People say, oh, well, I shouldn't have to do this, or it's my right to do this. I'm sorry, when were you, like, in the 1990s, when were you able to post a social media photo? I missed that part of the 90s, and I, I mean, I lived <laughs> through it. I don't remember that. Uh, this is a new phenomenon we're dealing with, so it's not your right to post to Instagram. Like, that's that's not at all a truth. Uh, what your, your responsibility, you should be thinking of your responsibility Responsibility and how this could impact everybody. We should all be doing our damnedest to to really uh, write the messaging and to focus more on the the aspects that shed light. Don't give them the ammo, which is the photo, in my opinion. Yeah. To to turn that against us. I'm not saying don't take your trophy photos. I mean, I took my buck I shot last year. I I came home with the, I probably took about 40 photos of that deer, and I came home and I had a I was by myself, so I had. Uh, just a camera on a monopod or a little tabletop tripod. And I had, you know, a couple of me like first approaching it from a remote that were pretty cool. And then I had my grip and grin photos in which I looked like a, a maniac. I don't even think I posted <laughs> those photos on go wild because I'm covered in blood. I just filled dressed this deer. Um, I didn't realize it, but I've apparently been kneeling in the blood. It's like up my leg my arms are in it to the elbow. I'm like, I don't want this out there. Like, that's just not respectful to me. So yeah. I like, that's really at the end of the day, think about like the respectfulness. You can't say you had respect for the animal at the, after looking at some of these photos. I mean, you didn't like, you might say you did and you might think you did in your heart, but when you look at the image you're putting out, you know, that, that speaks louder than anything you can say. There was one feeding off that there was one today that was posted on, on the Oregon hunters because the Facebook page, every state has its blank hunters of, of yeah. Idaho, Montana, whatever. Well, there's one of Oregon. This guy posts this headshot deer 
and one photo is pretty pretty good and then the other ones he's legitimately pulling the head apart I'm like why <laughs> why and then right it's like man you know like that's your call that's that's completely your call and if your face ends up on a pita slide somewhere you know that's right. that's that was your call i mean right i don't know i think yeah. i think that if we are all more conscious and and to get out you know because i i've already spoken on this in one one episode is you know do you want to be portrayed that way and then um what was the other point i was going to make is um you know those people that you're that are seeing that photo those folks yeah it's let's just pretend it is a right okay or it's a privilege because your hunting rights can be stripped tomorrow if the right vote goes right. through it really can right. Just like our, just like our gun rights can. I mean, they they honestly could be stripped nowadays. I mean, guys would have a fit over that. Yeah. But you go know. move to Chicago. Yeah, go go move to New York. You it, know, there's there's legislation that we don't have to deal with in certain parts of the country. Exactly. Well, that photo that that guy just posted, or that I just posted of me pulling that deer's face apart, that could be used to swing people's votes into something that I love. That is my rabbit ears quotations. Right. My right, you know. So. We got to treat treat it like it's a privilege. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's my God given right to go out and hunt. I do. I I, I do too. I, I do. think I think I yeah. Like at the end of the day, like if the government stopped me from hunting, yeah. Like I think there would be a right to have some mutiny around that, like, some recourse. You know, there, some recourse. So, but that doesn't mean that you know you don't respect the the process. The yeah. you know there's a societal contract that we all live within and we all agree to follow these laws set by the politicians that we voted in. So you can't expect that you you know just because hunting is a core of who you are that it's always going to be there. Right. Well, I just and like I said, it's our right. I believe in my head, but in society they don't agree with that. It's a privilege, and they that's feel like even, they can strip it not, from you. Yeah, it's not even that many people, man. That's a, that's what I was talking about—the outrage culture that we live in. Yeah. So, this is where it's manufactured. Social media has done so much. It's very manufactured, and it, it, social media has done so much harm in that regard because it's so easy for a small group of people to feel like the world is coming down on you. I mean, th th that has happened so many times to where, uh, you know, that's like, uh, I, you know, we brought up Rogan earlier. I'm a big Rogan fan. I know a lot of, there's things I <laughs> don't here. like about him, but I, I, th I think he's one of the better interviewers of our time. And I think he oh, gets absolutely. things out of people that uh, a normal interviewer can't. If you listen to the, the Roseanne Barr, yeah. um, the, the podcast he did with her, I think that's one of the most important podcasts that's been done over the last five years or so because it gets at the heart of what's wrong with us. You know, she, she didn't at all intend that to be what it, what it was intended. Like she, it's exactly parallel to what we're talking about. Right. Um, she had a commentary on Twitter, which she was semi drunk and on Ambien. So there's that, <laughs> but, uh, right. She, the, but she said something that was political and it got made out to be racist and she ended up losing her show over it. She ended up having suicidal thoughts. She was driven to a very dark place all because of a misunderstanding of what she intended, but people didn't care, man. Like that's the end of the day. Do you think people are going to slow down and be like, well, let's ask ourselves, maybe those baboons are assholes. You know, like nobody's <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. like maybe the, maybe the dude that piled up those baboons were right. Like nobody's saying that. Yeah. You know? Well, I'll tell you one thing I, I will give a baboon is that when we were driving in town one day, uh, we're, we're done hunting. We're heading back to the airport. I see people that don't do this. So I thought it was really funny. We drive by, past this big ass baboon. I mean, giant, you can't hunt him in town. Right. They're everywhere. Mm. And, uh, we're what driving. Big, I have no idea. What is a big baboon? Like I, I uh, I'm from, I'm from Southeastern I mean, Kentucky, bro. I have no I, idea what a baboon is. Seriously, if looks I like. stood up, I bet he would come past my waist. I mean, okay. He's huge. I mean, I don't know how big was how, he drove by him. How much I'd do you say think that weighs? 50 pounds, six, okay. 60 pounds. I don't know. I mean, I never I'm got to pick curious. one up, but I would guess like, it was 60 pounds. Okay, I didn't know how tall they got. Okay, now I have context. Gotcha. This is a pretty good sized baboon, and uh, I'm watching him. We're driving by. I'm watching him out my driver or my passenger side window, and uh, he's looking both ways. And then I'm like, <laughs> "Did I seriously just see that?" And then we go by, and then he looks back the other way, and then he crosses the road. And I was like, "No way!" 
That baboon I'm, just looked both ways. Yeah, I believe <laughs> like, it, man. It's smarter than most people out there <laughs> that I know of. Yeah, no kidding, man. Um, uh, so, but it was like, funny. man, that, I mean, those things are, are, they're everywhere over there. And then in the city, they are, they are everywhere. Like, they hang out on, right next to the roads. I mean, it is, it's like those monkeys that you see in the videos that steal people's hats and stuff. That's baboons and they're everywhere, at least where we were at in Windhook. Um, Sounds like a like a possum combined with a raccoon. It, <laughs> like like and when you live in a city, those kind of things can like the, you know they're menaces. Nobody's like, oh, look at the raccoon. Like exactly. that's kind of how they see these things. If I saw a baboon and I was just walking around by myself in Africa, I'd legitimately be like, okay, what what do I do here? Because those fangs are like three inches long. Like they got huge mm. canines, dude. They're I don't do know. They? They're vicious okay. little animals. I even asked my guide while we were there. And I asked all sorts of stupid questions because we were there for five days. I probably asked a thousand questions. No, I'm not even exaggerating there. One of my questions that I remember asking was, who would win in a fight? A jaguar, which we had him there, or two baboons? And he's like, oh, two baboons any day. He put no his kidding. money on the baboons. Wow. <laughs> he's like, they are vicious, man. I'm like, oh, okay, so you weren't kidding. I don't want to get close to him. He's like, no, like – I will shoot one if you get that close to one. I'm like, okay, yeah, copy. F you up. All right. All right. Good to know. So, yeah. And, well, this guy, you know, the the guy that the commissioner dude that we're talking about, he was within recurve range. So, he's super brave. But um, And I may be off well, base I did here. Read, That's just my I, experience from Africa. I did read, um, I, you know, I read that he was in an area where they're problematic. I, I, I believe, especially after talking to you now, that, that he was probably doing something that's justified yeah. and ethical. I don't know, Blake. I, given the mutual friends we have with him, I think he's probably a good dude. Yeah. I think he probably had a lapse in judgment. I've had lapses in judgment. I just yeah. think the lesson to be learned there is is that that can happen to any of us. You know, you're posting anywhere, you should assume everything you're presenting is going to get screenshotted. I had a rule when I was the uh, I was the editor of our college paper, which sounds kind of dumb because people like it sounds small, but it actually had like 40 employees. We were the big oh, third wow. largest third fourth largest newspaper in Kentucky. I mean, it was a pretty big organization, and we had had some massive screw ups. We had a rule that you didn't put anything into a template that you didn't want to go to print, hmm. and I think that's a good thing to live by in this day and age of hunting we're in. If if you would not want it to end up on a PETA billboard, you probably shouldn't post it on Facebook. <laughs> you shouldn't post it on Go Wild. You shouldn't post it anywhere. Really, like right. you should assume that somebody's always watching that you don't want to see it. Well, the only thing that I think, and that's just you say we say ethical and legal absolutely it's ethical to shoot a fawn and some right. you know i i personally won't do it because i just i hunt with a heart i can't i can't do it <laughs> i just can't pull the trigger man i i can't do it and i couldn't pull right. the trigger on a on a whatever you call a baby baboon a infant baboon i don't even know what you'd call a baby baboon but um i couldn't do it but what's what who am i to say that you can't right like right. if i can't i mean and so we all have these these moral compasses and these 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 battles with inside of us that say you know pull the trigger don't pull the trigger I'm going to Idaho here Thursday and I'm going there and I, some people would call me a trophy hunter I'm not shooting something unless it's 160 or above like I'm going there to kill sure. the biggest buck I've ever killed and some people are like well that's not right you're not doing it for me well I already got a full freezer this is just extra meat that now we can definitely have friends over. I don't mind sharing my back strap. I don't mind sharing my, my premium cuts. And, right. you know, it's just, I don't know, man. It just, it's so, multi, there's so many facets that go into this and so many variables. It's just, I, I just, it's the world we live in today. You know, like you, you yeah. call it the outrage culture and that's absolutely correct. And I don't know. I mean, we just have to be a little bit more cautious in like, like you said, if you're not wanting to have it spread along the world, don't even take the photo. Like, I do safety management consulting for logging companies and I do investigations where people have accidents or even fatalities. I don't even bring a camera. There's no, mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, it's not, I don't need to, I don't want those pictures getting out there. I don't want them on my files. I, I don't need them. Some guys take photos. I don't, you know, it's just, it, you, you can do the whole investigation for my job and not take one photo and still do a completely yeah. thorough job. And it's just, and that to me, that's the same mindset I take with hunting. And it's just, you know, is this a necessary photo? Is it going to get the intended, you know, goal 
that I want? Right. Is it going to get the intended reaction? Some people are taking those photos just trying to piss people off. <laughs> you yeah. know, they are, man. There's there's a group of people that you know they don't care, and uh, it's the same group that you know uses uh, words like libtard and snowflakes, and and yeah. I I I don't think those help. I think you are not making a point. I think you're trying to sound cool like at the end of the day that's what the, that approach is about and the guys that like to say that they don't care it's just chest thumping man and like it doesn't look cool like i'm, I'm never impressed by that uh for me i i know i know where i stand on the spectrum of you know people who, the guys who will you know their their um grip and grin will go down they'll die with it in their hand like yeah. that is theirs they feel like that's as much of a right as uh, shooting the deer or whatever it is themselves. Yeah, I'm just not there with you, man. Like I, I, I take them, I post them on Go Wild. I'm not post. I'm not posting them on Instagram anymore. I can get lit up for that. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, I have posted them there. I've posted them on Facebook. That's kind of what got me to start Go Wild in the first place. If if that pisses you off, that's fine. But uh, my story, when you look at my personal Instagram account, it's all food, dude. Like that's that's mm-hmm. what that's the story I'm telling. I'll show I show my experiences, and I might show a detail shot. Like I think a turkey season last year because I got skunked this year out of eight <laughs> days in the field. Um, the you know last year I think I had some detail shots to show how pretty the feathers are. But I'm just mm-hmm. I'm just not into like. I know I I have fr- I'm friends with vegans and I'm friends with people that I know are anti hunters and I don't want them to see that and have that against me. Yeah. I want them to see over and over and over again how much food I make out of that deer that I shot. Yeah, and I want them to see me sharing it with my friends and family. And you can hate on that if you want to, but you know what? It's a pretty hard. It's pretty hard to put a hole in that story. I agree. And to to expand on that, when I shoot something and I'm taking pictures of it. I'm not going to say remorse, but there is such a sobering emotion when I walk up on a on a big game animal, say a deer or an elk, and I get up to it, and I'm like, I just killed you. Yeah, and, dude, I've, I've you know, said remorse, and I've got, I got lit up on a podcast. If anybody wants to hear this happen in real time, episode three of Restless Native, uh, Scott <laughs> Ellis and I got into it, and I say into it, it, it was a cordial debate, but yeah. Scott was pretty passionately arguing against me on this. Huh. I said the word remorse, I backed off of it in that show, and I've since thought about this so much that I'm like, you know what, I don't, Scott's point is if you think you're going to have remorse, you shouldn't shoot the animal in the first place. And he, he makes a really valid point. I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to try to give Scott's words. Uh, he's a very smart guy, really, really capable hunter. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if people don't know who he is, he's a three time grand national champion Turkey caller. Oh, wow. I mean, he, he's, he's a bad, bad mofo with the Turkey call. Um, and I like Scott a lot, but, uh, you know, his point was like, you shouldn't shoot an animal unless you're ready to watch it die. And I'm like, I totally get that. I'm always ready to watch that happen. But with big game animals, like you said, and I've only hunted deer, I haven't hunted elk. Um, but you know, there's like, I actually, this year was the first year, um, I actually saw the deer because it, it didn't run into the brush. It didn't run a hundred yards off and I have to find it. Like mm-hmm. I saw it. It was a very, uh, quick death. And I was like, man, this really sucks. Like I, it hurts to watch something die and suffer, even if it's for a few seconds. And you know what, if you don't have that, that's fine. But I'll tell you what, after I, after that podcast went live, I was shocked at how many people reached out to me and said, Hey man, I got that too. And the day I lose it is the day I quit hunting, you yeah. know? And I think there's, those are the kind of people that I assume would probably fall more in the line with the guidelines of what I'm talking about. And if you don't have that, I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. I think sometimes we hunt so much that we get desensitized to it just yeah. in the same way you would at a slaughterhouse. And I think yeah. that's okay too. Um, cause I still know a lot. Scott is a very respectful person. Scott, I know would post like Scott is not posting the kind of pictures we're talking about that are disrespectful. So it, just because you have that attitude too, doesn't mean you're disrespectful. I just think that, uh, for me personally, I totally connect with you when you say remorse. Like I'm, yeah. I'm pretty much there. I know Cam Cam Haynes to bring up the all these these guys that we all absorb all these podcasts from. I know he, you know, he says uh, reverence for the animal, and I'm like, that's not even it for me. Like I, I have that, but that's not what I'm talking about when I have that moment. You yeah. know, there's a moment of remorse, and I don't I don't care to say that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I could call my my emotions and remorse. It's just it's just a. Sad because I love deer and elk, you know, and bears. I love the animals that I hunt, but again, it is part of that. It's like disciplining your child, and like even though you don't want to, you have to. And I'm 
you're going to try and bring that that's around. That's exactly here. what it is. That's the best analogy um, from a dude that doesn't have kids. Uh, <laughs> but, I got dogs. But no, man, it's like sometimes like I just want to play with my kid. And like sometimes, yeah, I wish you didn't have to go to bed, but we have to do this. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. I'm not remorseful when I put him to bed, right? But right. it's like, you Kills know, you. it's something it's something that I have to do. And yeah. uh, so it, I don't know. I have yet to find a better word that feels like remorse. Um, when I watch an animal die, there's a like, it's brief. We're talking we, the moment we've been talking about is longer than it lasts. We're yeah. talking about a matter of seconds, but I have 10 to 15 seconds of like, Oh man. And then I walk up on that animal and I'm like, this is awesome. I'm getting ready to butcher, you know, 60 pounds of meat or whatever it is, you know? And yeah. that part makes me really happy and I get super excited about it. And I like that more than the hunt itself. Yeah. The, the moment ends for me when I, when I, grab my knife that is about yep. the immediate moment when my emotions change and me too man it's just as soon as i grab that knife every cut i make it's like hell yeah this is gonna yep. taste so good yeah dude. Uh, i just i don't know i mean I, and i i struggle to find a word for it too but you know and i'm glad you're, you're okay with that analogy because i was like man you know it's like disciplining you don't want to and you feel bad no, but it's, it's necessary <laughs> All right, we we uh we went down that rabbit hole. What uh, public land versus private land? I believe yeah. it was the. the so I want to frame this. I want to frame this for you. So where? What state do you live in? I'm in Kentucky. Kentucky. I have a feeling that each state's probably a little bit different on the public lands. So that may sway the way we look at things, right? Yeah. So what what's public land look like in Kentucky? Well, where I am now, that's what's going to say. Don't write me off, and I feel like I got written off on my post on Go Wild the other day <laughs> because I'm in Kentucky, and we only have four percent of our land as public land. Oh, geez. But listen, but listen, I'm from Eastern Kentucky. We have like I'm willing to bet the majority of the state's public land is where I'm from. Okay. I where I grew up, I am a five minute. No, it's not even that. It's it's about a mile. Uh, no, it's gosh, it's like half a mile from my parents' house to the mountain, and huh. I'm on public land. Like I can get on public land from where I grew up faster than you can. I guarantee it. Unless you live on it, yeah, like that's how. Like, and then it's miles. Like I can drive for miles. Huh. So, um, I felt like people immediately jumped into like you don't know what you're talking about. You've never had a spot. You've never looked for land. And it's like no, I haven't done it to the like the level that you all do. That you hike 20 miles and you do all this stuff. Yeah. But and and I I also feel like I on this post I said. Actually, I'll, I'll say what I said in a minute. But we do have public land out here. I know a lot of guys who kill massive bucks on public land in Kentucky. Uh, whitetail, obviously. We do have an elk population here. It's the largest elk population east of the Mississippi. But it's it's a very tough tag to draw. There's obviously a lot of competition for this. Uh, oh, I bet. And they and uh, the but I think the population is. Um, I've heard anywhere from twenty to forty thousand elk. And uh, yep. Jesus, it's it's a massive population. I remember when they brought it back in the nineties, um, because we didn't have them. Uh, but but they have absolutely boomed. They brought them back to my home county and a couple other counties, and now they're everywhere in eastern Kentucky. Um, yeah, but but so I mean, I I understand, and I've been out west, and I haven't hunted out west, but I mean, like I get the differences, but I also feel like I've grown up with this enough to also like the. I have friends who will not tell me where they hunt. Like I, 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 like it's public land and they're not, he's like, I'm like, where do you hunt? And he's like, Oh, well, and he'll give you some vague, like coal mine that, you know, covers like 10,000 square, you know, uh, or acres. And so yeah. it's, I get it. Like I do, I do get it. And I know that it's like, it seems like I don't. And I guess in some ways I don't in that you guys elk hunt, you camp back country. I, I get that that part's different, but the conversation that this whole thing was around was the spot, right? Like that's what yeah. the conversation was. Yeah. Well, my thing was is that it would be even more important for you guys having more limited spots. Yeah. Like I was having a conversation with a buddy the other day, and he's like, "I can't believe anybody talks about hunting over there." Like, I don't know what a public what's a what's a good amount of public land? How many acres would you would you guess it? Down there, a lot of them are about. Uh, there's like a 10,000 acre plot. Uh, oh, wow. there's, there's a couple that are that size. There's some like 6,000 acres. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot where I'm from. That's a like huge, it, that's a huge area. Uh, these are, these are all within like 30, it's less than 30 minutes, 20 minutes. I was picturing in my head 
just because I'm imagining things is like, man, they probably have like 10 acres here, 20 acres there, and then it's surrounded no, man, by uh, private. Uh, where I'm from, it's the Appalachian Mountains. So, I mean, it's 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 mountainous as all get out. It's not steep like the Rockies. It's not, you know, but it, it is remote. I mean, I, I it's kind of funny because I see all these people posting from the backcountry out west. It's like I don't even have service where I hunt. Okay, like we're <laughs> it's so remote. Like I, it's, yeah. I'm within ten minutes from my parents' house. I lose service. Um, I didn't hunt down there this year, but I hunted down there last year, and it's just it's rugged territory, man. I mean, it's not it's not like um you know I think uh a lot of people probably associate more with like where I'm at now where it's more horse country in Kentucky, it's rolling hills. We have um, a lot of even flat farmland, but where I'm from, we don't have farmland. Like mm-hmm. your horse is, is literally the horse, it's, it's grazing area, is the like flat spot where they scraped out for a barn off the side of a mountain. Oh, like, really? It's, it's, yeah, it's I didn't very know there was different. that in Kentucky. Yeah, man. Eastern Kentucky is very mountainous. I, I mean, had the, no the, idea. The, the, uh, Black Mountain, uh, well, black, that that's actually more towards down uh, Asheville. If you think of like the Asheville area, like those mountains, are you mm-hmm. familiar with like Blue Ridge? I have it looks no idea. the same. Oh uh, well, um, I'll tell you what. I'll I'll tag you. I'll I'll send you a picture after this, and you can see okay. what I'm talking about. But I mean, when I where I go on some of these areas, I can get up to the top of a ridge, and I can look, and I can see mountain after mountain after mountain, and there's nothing else in sight. Really. It's very similar to what you all have out there. Just a different, a little bit different topography and maybe vegetation. Topography is different, yeah. But I mean, like you're remote. I mean, you you are very remote when you get up onto some of these areas. I mean, I've I've driven four wheelers for hours, and we've like gone going one way, and you're on public land the whole way. Really? Yeah. That's insane. Well, I feel like. Because coming into this thing, I had that you know preconceived idea. I was like, man, it would be more important if there's that limited of public land over there. And maybe well, that's now, where, where guys, I'm at. Well, where I'm at, it's very you're you're spot on. Like, yeah. but but you're not gonna have a good spot because it's so limited here. Yeah. Like I, I've seen some guys posting about it on Go Wild actually even today talking about how it's just like man, there's nothing here because it's like there's so much action on those areas. Yeah. Like, I mean, the running joke in Kentucky is that those areas are like Walmart parking lot on opening day, gun day is, which is true. <laughs> I mean, I, I had that experience, um, at, at this one particular part of uh, public land near my parents' house. Cause it's the most accessible. It is. I mean, you can literally just sit on one side of the, the valley and you can spot the orange. Like you can sit and count people just really? sitting like a hundred yards apart. Oh geez. <laughs> So, so in some ways, like your analogy is not off. I just think that the Westerners think that like no one on the Eastern side of the country knows what, <laughs> like what it looks like to look and see just nothing. And it's right. like, no, I can, I totally get that. So for a backcountry Kentucky hunt, um, do you get into a lot of deer back there and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Some of these guys that are hardcore that are like, there's guys that'll, I've, I've, uh, had friends who've told me about this guy that they'll know. Like I've, I've not talked to these people personally, but they're the guys that'll drive their four wheeler for an hour and a half. And then they're going to hike for an hour. And um, you know, they're going to get into the most remote, nastiest, thickest, you know, area that they can get to. What was your original question? Is, you know, is there a lot of animals back there and a lot of pressure? Oh, are there animals? Uh, not honestly, man. No, southeastern Kentucky is in bad shape on deer right now. Um, it's one of the most restricted areas in, in the state. Um, I don't know. Oh, I wish I had the like bio, biodiversity bio, biological answer on why that is. Um, I, I do know that Kentucky is considered one of the top ten whitetail uh, as a state. But I don't think that it's it's probably not my region that's kicking out the most. Now, where I say my region, where I'm from. Now, again, I don't live down there today. Like where I'm at today, I, I'll give you an example. I drove back from the park the other day. I live in Louisville. It's a very green city. Um, I, I I'm on the outskirts, and I in a two mile stretch, I counted almost sixty deer. Really? And so we're we're just overloaded in my area here. And in fact, they just uh, increased. You're uh, the, I mean, you can shoot just unlimited deer here. I mean, you you just keep buying tags, just keep buying tags. You can shoot does all day long. Uh Now the still one buck, but I mean the, so up here is totally different than three hour drive back home. Um, down there, I think they did open up, um, gun season just a hair this year. 
but overall, um, that you cannot shoot does um, at all during gun season. You uh, you can take a. I think there might be a count on does with even with archery down there. You might be able to take like two. Hmm. So so I'm surprised you, it's, they don't it's, trap them and move them. They do that in our state. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, um, I don't know why Kentucky if, or they and they may have. Um, unfortunately, I just don't know enough of what what the issues are hmm. uh, with. Now I've heard of. Um, you know, you hear all these speculation. Uh, there was a there were rumors going around, and I've even seen this posted on Go Wild of like blue tongue hitting Eastern Kentucky hard. I, I I've heard that there's um, there are certain other things that impact deer that get mislabeled as blue tongue, um, and I don't want to spread those rumors. But um, I mean, as far as I know, the population's healthy in terms of disease. It's it's not we don't we don't have any CWD here yet. Um, I'm sure that's coming um, as soon as they can. Uh, get across the Ohio because I know they're in um, Ohio River. That is, I know they're in Ohio and a couple other um, nearby states. But now the, the area with the most public land uh, actually has the fewest deer population. Okay, so for this for this topic that we're on about public land spots, this stemmed from the Rogan Dudley podcast, right? And Rogan was pretty much just tearing Dudley's argument apart from a very logical perspective. From, in my opinion, somebody that – a perspective from somebody that, that didn't grow up with the struggle. Yeah, um, I agree with that. So what what would be your perspective? Say if um, I go hunting with you, I'm, I'm, a new, I'm a new hunter, and you take me out to a spot. And then it's a spot that you hunt that you know about, and then the next week and I bring myself or I bring another buddy out there, is that a no-no? Or what? What's your perspective on? Can on we back up? Because uh, um, can we back up and assume uh, that people haven't seen that episode? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. That episode. Uh, I want to frame up what I heard in the show, and you can fill in the gap if you want to. But yeah. The, that, I was interested in hearing this because I, I actually I really didn't even care to listen to this episode. I don't know why. I've just not been into hunting shows lately. I know it sounds crazy. I'm just like I'm, my, <laughs> my my job is hunting, yeah. and I listen to a lot of hunting shows. It's like I'm dealing with hunting advertisements all day. Sometimes it's nice to break out and not listen to hunting stuff. Yeah. Um, so I was like, you know what? Everybody's talking about this public land thing. It's the only reason I listen to this show. So Rogan, I think Rogan almost was su- surprised that Dudley disagreed with him, but he, he <laughs> sl- starts going in on how insane it is that these guys think that they own this public land. Right. And th- leading in, he's like, well, that's my spot. And you can come to my spot. And like, he's, you know, being himself and being yeah. really funny about it. And, and Dudley didn't think it was funny. And right. Dudley's like, well, but I mean, you, you're the one they're the one that worked for it they're the one that you know has put in the time and i'm paraphrasing and butchering all this people right. so go back and listen yourself but i'm trying to for the sake of this conversation essentially rogan rogan's point and this is the part i said i agree with is that it's not yours and i agree it's not yours i think there's a lot of strange arguments that come out of this and i have no people um back in back home in southeastern kentucky especially that's where most of my context comes from is you know, well, uh, I, I was hunting in my spot today, and this guy just drove right through on his side by side. Or, you know, I'll see people talking yeah. about how, well, these these guys on uh, uh, mountain bikes ruined my hunt today. Or, or you know, the, these people were out at the fishing hole, and they just were having a great old time and ruined my spot. And I, like, that's the concept <laughs> that Rogan was talking about uh. to me that I identified with. And it's kind of funny because uh, – well, actually, you had a question. I'll, that's that was the conversation that I heard. So that's yeah. my paraphrase of it. It's it's a, probably a twenty minute debate on the show. So yeah, people should tune in to get the full um, f- uh, to hear Joe and Dudley make their arguments. It was a good well. conversation too. It was. I felt like Dudley didn't get into it half as much as he wanted to. Just no. out of uh, I don't know if it's out of fear of like Rogan being Rogan and like just, man overpowering you. Or, I don't think. You, the guy's not going to get it. He's not going to yeah. understand. Is that what it is? You think he's just like he's like? There's really no point in this because exactly. I mean, here's the thing. I I don't know Joe Rogan. Obviously, I mean I uh, I've I don't know him personally. Um, funny enough, I've like chatted with him briefly on our Instagram account, which is like my one claim to fame. I have nothing <laughs> here. Um, he he follows Go Wild on Instagram, and I think it's just because he likes the pictures we take. Uh. Uh, <laughs> so. So that's like my one little touch point with Joe Rogan. But I don't know the dude um, from anybody. But he has a lot of money, more money than any of us can fathom, okay? That podcast makes more money than most of us in a year or even a month than most of us will see 
in tens of years or yeah. our lifetime even. So yes, he can go out and pay $20,000 for an elk and it feels about like you and I going out and paying like $30 for a steak. Yeah. Like that's the fact of the matter. And I think people are really resentful of that and people are really bitter about that and they don't like it. And I, that's where a lot of the, the derogatory commentary I've seen about it. I'm like, they're like, well, 370, uh, private bulls aren't, as good as 290 public land bulls. And it's like, <laughs> what? I mean, the dude didn't even, he didn't drop. It's not like you drop stats like that. He didn't even post the picture, first of all. Yeah. Um, and all I've seen was like congratulatory, congratulatory posts from like uh, Cam Haynes and Dudley. And I just think it's strange that there's such animosity for a guy like that, you know, essentially did something that's totally legal, and every one of those dudes would do it if they got the invite. Okay, here's that's the fact yes. of the matter. <laughs> Absolutely, they would. Yes. Yeah, it's like uh, you can still chase public land and hunt private too. Exactly. But the uh, I'm sorry, I keep getting fired up and like steamrolling your question. No, keep here. going, man. The, I like it. Well, I mean, to me, to me, Rogan's point that I identified with, and when, so on Go Wild. Let me back up real quick on this part too. On Go Wild, you can share that you've listened to a podcast. So yes. a lot of people like to log time for their podcasts. This is a feature we added in because we actually noticed how much podcast was getting were getting talked about, and it's cool. You know what? There's not another place where you can really talk podcasts. You can post a screenshot on Instagram or something, but we have what shows you're listening to, how long the show was, and we have a community that logs tens of thousands of hours on these things okay in a couple of months this audience logged like 70,000 hours of Cody Rich's show Jesus. on our app oh. I mean it was like 48 days of podcast um, within a couple months so I mean it's really cool there's a really niche community that we found in here so I logged my time for listening to Joe Rogan and I said um, <laughs> funny enough I agree with 80% of what Joe Rogan said which I still do I agree with the points he was making about the fact that it's public land it's not yours like you don't have this little slice of the island that nobody else can touch <laughs> right I, I said agree. in in the post I said I also agree with John Dudley and I uh, <laughs> I said it should be frowned upon I don't remember what exactly what I said but it was like essentially my point was like yes it should be frowned upon if I take a buddy to a, a hunting spot and he comes back with like 12 of his buddies like yeah. that is obviously an ethics that, that we can all follow and agree like there's a moral code by this but it just proceeds like I feel like everybody read the part where I agreed with Joe <laughs> Rogan and like no one cared after that it, I mean yeah. like uh, I'll pick on Cody because uh, I know he won't care um, and I'm actually me and him even and texted about it. I was like, dude, that's not what I meant. Um, but, but he, and he was just giving me a hard time, but, uh, you know, Cody commented on it and, uh, uh my buddy James and uh, you were on there and I think there were a couple other people. Yeah. I think I even had people mention it later and they didn't even comment. So it's like, it obviously made an impact. I think it had 50 comments on it. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it was kind of funny and there were a lot of healthy debates came out of it. Uh, most of these guys are like, no, you're dead to me if um, <laughs> if you take my spot. And I think they're serious. And Cody's like, you're never coming hunting with me. And he might be serious, <laughs> uh, but it's fine, man. It's like it's it's all fun and games. Like I know I know at the end of the day, like they're they're just participating in conversation, give me a hard time. But I was like, that's not my point. Like I'm not trying to say like, show me your spot. I'm going to bring my friends. Mm -hmm. I, my my point was just around this idea of t having so much pride in public land and about it being accessible to everyone. And then also getting pissed off at people for like your spot, mm -hmm. like that contradicts itself. I also think it's really messed up that people get so into the fact of earning this public land spot and then get so they're so disappointed with somebody else who has earned the right to buy or their ability to buy private land. Like that's something they earn. Don't take that away from them. Right. If, if I had the money right now to buy a hundred acres in Southeastern Kentucky, I would do it in a heartbeat and I would not apologize to you for it. And they shouldn't have to either. That's where I, that was my biggest point. I was trying to make a second biggest point was that there's this weird conflict that goes on of like your, your ability to earn a public land spot is somehow better then my ability, like I've worked hard in my life and I've earned the ability to buy a private land. Like, I feel like there's a weird, um, it's like, it's like these public land guys that have this, like, and, and I like a lot of these guys and I'm with you, like keep, keep it public. I'm, I'm there. I understand all that. And I, I, I'm, I think it's valuable, but I think there's something that breaks down with the private land. It's like a, a battle. Like a, there's like this separation that people don't want to um, say that that's okay. When in fact, 
you look at a place like Texas and wildlife is actually booming there. I mean, they've, uh, uh, and even in native wildlife, it's not just exotics. There's a lot of research that actually shows that a lot of private land has been better for wildlife. Now, is that better for hunting? I don't know. I, I could probably make arguments that it's not. Um, it's, it's certainly harder to get access and expensive to get access in a place like Texas. Um, you know, you're looking at thousands of dollars for a lease, but, um, my, one of my points was that there is a strange dichotomy that lives within public land hunters who are so proud of their spot, but also bash p- private landowners. So I want you to elaborate on one point you made where you said it's a contradiction. Mm-hmm. Um, elaborate on that for me. Expand on that because I, I want to understand – your, well, your I think it's I think it's that. strange to say that, like I earned this spot, I put in the time, it's mine, mm-hmm. but it's public land. But okay, uh, like it's a public land spot, and you're you're proud that it's yours. Yeah. But then I see a lot of these people, like the example I made a second ago of people bashing somebody that has earned the right or the ability to go out and hunt a private farm, or maybe they have their own private farm. Right. I think that's strange. Those people, like, uh, uh, let's give a, let's just take Joe Rogan out of it and say a successful CEO. Yeah. Well, I am my, running my, a company. My, my question, sorry, my question was for the for the public land contradiction. Yeah. How is like, it's your spot, but yeah. it's public land. So help. Oh right. Help bridge that. Yeah, I'm, I I think it's fine to say it's my spot. I'm not going to tell my buddies. Like I'm with you on that. <laughs> it's it's the people that like I don't understand how like you can get mad if I wander in. Like I I know people. I've oh, seen people I do see this. What you're saying. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Like I see what you're it's saying. it's not yours, man. Like right. you don't own it. You didn't. You can't put up a fence around it. You can't like. I, I mean, this happened um, in southeastern Kentucky recently. I'll give you a good example here. Um, this dude put up trail cameras. And he figures out people are coming into his area. He booby trapped his trail cameras and made them explosive. Oh, seriously! On public land to keep people away from it. The FBI had to get involved because there were bombs in the woods. And I'm, I'm going. I'm getting ready to go deer hunting down there last year, or maybe it was two years ago. I don't remember when this happened. My mom sends me an article, and she's like, make sure you're not touching any trail cameras. I mean, this dude was making explosives because he felt like it was his spot. That's it's public crazy. land, man. Like, it's not yours. Okay. You don't have a right to keep people away from it. That's the that's what I'm talking about. I know there are guys like you and Cody and James. Like, you guys are all cool. Like, I know you're not that guy that's going to do that. But, man, there's a lot of this bro culture. Like, I, like this is mine. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that ha- doesn't have hunting in its best interest. There's probably a lot of people that make the same mistakes we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, I, 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 that's more of what I'm getting at. And I, th- okay. I think it's, I think it's a very complex thing to explain over a post for one thing. Um, yeah, I feel I like think people it, definitely misinterpreted your, your view. I didn't explain it very well and I'm still figuring out my view too. Here, that's the thing, <laughs> Garrett. Like, I, I think it's silly for all of us to say that we have any of this figured out. Um, you know, the, the public lands debate, uh, you know, I kind of alluded to the uncertainty there of, of what's better for wildlife. There's, there's some research that shows that private landowners have taken better care of their land than states are able to. And then, you know, the, there's then the debate of, okay, the current administration is trying to turn land over to the states. Can the states even handle that? I mean, that's a question in, in itself is like, are they going to be able to afford to, to handle this land uh, when they're struggling with their budgets right now. So uh, the, it, there's a lot of uncertainty there. I don't think any of us should assume we have that part of it figured out. Mm-hmm. Um, I so, love your point about private landowners being able to potentially have better habitat for wildlife because mm-hmm. I know I'll bring up two examples, and I'm agreeing with you on this one because in Africa, in uh, the little town that we drove through, um, there's a highway and then there's a gravel road. We drove for like a 45 minutes on this gravel road, going like 50. It was a great gravel mm-hmm. road. I mean, the guy was just hauling ass down that road. And uh, I'm like glued to my window trying to see my first big game African animal out in the wild, you know, like one that you could shoot if you saw, you know. Yeah. And um, for 45 minutes, I didn't see one. And after like 40 minutes, like right before we get to the edge of the property, I'm like – Where's all the animals, man? Like, I was expecting to see shit standing around everywhere. You know, he's like, you're not going to see anything here. And I asked him, like, well, why is that? And he's like, well, because the local – there's not really any hunting conservation there. There's nothing. 
Mm. You see something, you could shoot it and eat it that night. Don't matter. Yeah. He's like, the locals love meat. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. they've killed everything. He's like, starting at these two signs up here, um, like, you know, X amount of miles to this town sign, you'll start seeing animals. And right before we got to those signs, we saw two ostriches standing right off the side of the road. And I'm like, huh. I'm like, what's the deal with those signs? He's like, this is about the beginning of my property. And uh, as soon as we hit his property, we probably saw two or three hundred animals and he called it a farm it's mm-hmm. a hundred thousand acre farm and uh it was just i'm like if there was not that there would not be any animals period like right that private landowner not only supplied really good income for some of the locals there um about 30 mm-hmm. and keep in mind there's poverty stricken stricken towns you know an hour hour and a half away Um, But he was also keeping and managing and actually had his own management plan. He was bringing in animals that he needed to help with this. It was, it was absolutely incredible. And um, now transfer that over to Oregon. We have, it's kind of funny. We have a lot of what we would call rabbit ears, public land, but it's actually timber owners that allow people to have access on their land. And it's in no way it could tomorrow could be stripped from us. Um, Yeah. I live. We've got, we've got some of those relationships here too. Yeah, I think you guys probably have. Um, I know a company over here, Roseburg Lumber, has property down in Mississippi and, st- and stuff like that. Uh, Warehousers are one of the largest timber owners in, in the world. Period. Yeah. And I live from um, about ten minutes from one of the most populated elk units, where I could go kill an elk 10, 15 minutes away, and it's all warehouser like. <laughs> It is 90% warehouser, and I was just looking at the uh, – I bought a lease for $375. Bucks. It's per, it's a it's a key to get on the property. For $375, bucks, I got like 70 – was that 171,000 acres? Wow. Um, but anyways, it just shows you how much land is on there. But I bought that not only because they manage the lands way better than yeah. the BLM and the Forest Service do, so the elk and the deer and the bears – they love those units. They love those logged areas. Well, BLM pretty much only thins. Forest Service doesn't really do much. And so that is absolutely – that's the most that's the most populated elk unit in Oregon, right? Right there. That is the most heavily logged unit in Oregon, yeah. and it's private. Most of it's private. And uh, that just pretty much proves your point right there that you're in, my, in Oregon at least and in Africa, you're spot on. I mean – there's not even an argument. I mean, anybody asks you where the elk are, go check a unit. Well, yeah. that's probably private. My uh, my cousin works. Well, he actually he doesn't anymore, but he worked on the strip mines for years, and they would hang trail cameras up, and they were they were the only ones allowed to hunt these properties. I mean, in theory, I mean, it's so much land that people would sneak in. But I mean, in theory, you'd supposedly pass these guard shacks or whatever. And uh, it, same kind of deal, though. I mean, you know, you're, you've got people that are you know, protective of what's there. They're not letting every Tom, Dick and Harry come through. Um, so you do manage it to an extent. Now there's a whole other podcast and a, and a half, uh, maybe a whole series to be done on the impacts of coal mining and environment. And I've, I've talked a lot about that on shows recently too. I think that's also something that's very hard to dissect. We, we, we won't get down that rabbit hole today, but um, you know, the, uh, there are, it's a weird it's a weird conversation that's not black and white. I think our brains like to try to f- segment things into good and bad. Um, we've done this to the point of today to where we, we hear a, we see a headline and we read it. And before we've even read the damn story, we've made up our mind yeah. which side we're on. And, and beyond that, before we even think about the fact that this is CNN or this is Fox News or, you know, whatever um, other publication you want to throw out there, they're all biased, man. Like, I... I don't ever you should never trust whatever it's coming from um this i have all of those apps i have i have probably 12 news apps on my phone um and i don't have time to read all of those but a lot of times i can even just tell the biases from my push notifications you know of the headlines so um i just think that we we try to segment things so quickly and to say that like well, obviously, anything that public land is good, anything private is bad. You know, it's like a lot of people try to make it that simple, and it's just not. It's just silly to make it. Like, it has to be that way, too. Right. Like what? Like you just said, how how big did you say the uh, 100,000 acres Yeah. on the African property? Yeah. What's, what's funny is some people would say that they're like, well, 
that's just nowhere near as hard as my my private uh, uh, like when it's like 10,000 acres <laughs> and, and that you could make an argument and I'm not saying this is true but you can make an argument. It's like, well, man, it's a lot more land to cover on a hundred thousand acres than ten thousand. So, like, the animals are more spread out. You know, it's it's, and I they'll flip around and say, yeah, but they feed them and they're there and stocked and all this stuff. And it's like they're right too. Like, there's all all these layers to being to what's true to this stuff. But yeah, um, the, with the public and private land thing, my greatest point was people that tried to claim ownership to something. It's it's not yours. That's where Rogan is right, and I think a lot of his point was actually founded in that. Um, I don't think Rogan. I don't think if Dudley showed Rogan a spot, he's gonna go out there tomorrow with Ari Shafir <laughs> or whatever Ari Shafir and like show him. Like that's not. I don't. I, I know he said that, but like I don't. I don't feel like. I feel like that part of the conversation is what everybody's been talking about. Right. But um, and I get it. It's it's honestly kind of fun to pick on. I mean, he's a public figure. He's got it coming. Nobody feels sorry for the guy at the end of the day. <laughs> right. Um, but, but I don't know. I, I, I think I got lumped into that pretty quickly of being like this <laughs> maniac. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what well, are you when, crazy? When I, heard, when I read the post, I immediately jumped. I'm like, no way. No yeah. way does he think that. No, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny, man. I mean, I, um, I mean, I'm even really protective of the spots I have here. I'm not going to take people to it, not for fear of them going back. It's just like you hunting is a, a privilege. We've talked about it within the government, but it's a privilege of the landowners I get access from too. I'm going to be very careful about who I take onto a property that I've got permission to. So, um, you know, that's a whole other layer to this whole thing on when you got private, when you're hunting private land, which I do right now and I don't care to say that i mean it's it's like i got two kids and a running a company (laughs) of my own and i'm working like 70 hour weeks so it's nice to be able to drive 30 minutes to a spot instead of driving three hours back home where there's no deer anyways (laughs) right well technically Uh, i'm not hunting i'm not hunting um public land even though in my head you know where what i'm hunting now it's we took it for granted here and and it only started about three years ago where we had to pay for access Mm-hmm. And so everybody's hunting it, and you know, if you shot one, you you would tell, you would have said that was public land. I mean, yeah, right. and I I still caught myself telling people it was public land, even though technically it's not. But right, I grew up hunting that, and I don't know, man. It's I wish I was way more knowledgeable on the uh, timberland owner Waco thing because. I mean, and I I can't get too deep into it because of my day job, <laughs> but All right. Um, I just I think it's so messed up that they're charging and for that even though I understand people dump trash and they do bad things on the property and I understand yeah, that, that but fee it's can also honestly deter I mean it's a de- nice deterrent if if nothing else to keep you know certain people out yeah. um I don't I don't know enough about structure of what you're talking about um yeah. I I I need to do more research on you know I I uh a lot of people take this public land fight. Um, you know, it's like their bread and butter, what they love, and I think it's important. I don't think it's the most important thing we face today. So I, I'm not as much wrapped up in that. It's not what's true to my heart. Um, yeah. I don't. I don't personally care if you're an urban bow hunter. If you're hunting ten acres, if you're hunting an acre, I don't care if it's half an acre. Go hunt. Like yeah. I don't. It doesn't matter. Like that's where I fall more on this this whole thing of, and that's that's a lot of our mission at Go Wild is to um, really make a platform where people can ask questions they could learn and they can not feel intimidated uh you know i'm i know as we get bigger we're gonna people like the people i've i've given a hard time tonight of like you know the 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 ones that um are very brochacho about it they're, they're gonna make their way into our platform but um you know we'll, we'll deal with that when it comes but today it's a very supportive place you mentioned it earlier and and uh that's i think some of that has stemmed from um, the culture that we've tried to create with it. But I think a lot of it's just the group of people that are in there. Um, but that's, that's true to my heart. That's what I try to focus on is like recruitment and getting more people yeah. involved. So I'm not as knowledgeable on this and I'm, I'm new to big game hunting. Um, you know, it's like getting reconnected with hunting over the last eight years. Um, big game hunting. I've killed four deer. I don't care. I'm not, not, I'm not some slayer. I've not got like 140 deer under my belt or anything here. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, if, uh, most got, guys over where you live, if they heard how many deer we've killed over here, were like, "What? That's it?" I'm like, "We can only shoot one or two a year, dude." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not well, six. <laughs> where, where I'm from, like, you get one uh, a year, but you also get like, unless you're a bow hunter, but you get like 
one buck you can't even shoot a doe if you see one so it's like it's even more restricted down there wow now some of these southern states there's areas in georgia from what i understand you can just go and you can shoot seven and then you can come back tomorrow and shoot eight and you can come back like it's just they're so overpopulated in some of these areas man that's insane Um, it is insane i mean kentucky i guess theoretically it's endless if you keep buying tags uh where i'm at now uh because we're just i mean they're like i said i saw 60 in a less than two mile drive um and that was not like a group of 40 that was it like three or four at a time really it was it was nuts so that i think it's um you know it it it, there's there's levels to all this stuff you know there's it's there's just it's everything's so much more complex um Oh, so, I was talking about. I was wrapping up my my point about. Sorry, I'm like I'm like. Where were you going with that? No worries. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, my, but like a lot of what I've tried to be passionate about is just the different types of hunters and like the different levels of hunters and making a platform that they can have conversations with each other to try to make more hunters overall. If they're going to be private or public, I don't really care. Like I, I, I mean, I, my buddy uh, Buck Robinson has a platform it's the airbnb of hunting like he's created something that you can lease your land and go on there and look at all these different properties if you want to go try out land on saturday for 35 dollars, you can go do that that's and i'm cool. like dude that's the future right there like that's what we need and there's people that are fighting it because it's not what they grew up with and i'm like i don't care like you're you're gonna you're gonna lose you're gonna go down with the ship with that attitude right. so um that's where a lot of this comes at for me and honestly to bring things back to that original post that kind of got me and you talking about this whole show. Like a lot of my point was the idea that people would not show their spot to somebody who wanted to learn about hunting and was new to hunting to me is a tragedy like that. Your spot is not as important as getting somebody out there. Like no matter what, like I'll say that. And that's part where some people are probably like, dude, now this guy, this, this yeah. crazy Kentucky guy, like they, I probably just got written off by everybody else that hadn't <laughs> written me off. Um, but I feel very strongly about that. Like the, the numbers are not good. I know there's some Western areas that, you know, that was uh, something I was talking to another user on go wild about was the debate of, um, the impacts of numbers, but like, there's nothing out there that supports that. I mean, Western states have, have had somewhat of some states have had an uptick, um, to help balance some of the falling numbers, Mm -hmm. but those states have high churn there. It's not like they're having an uptick and then it stays. You've got a lot of non-resident hunters coming in and out and even the residents are churning. I mean, it's hard. What you guys do is really hard physically. So you, you you better believe that you're not going to have people getting into their 60s like we do out here like a 60 year old can go hunt where we are now they're probably like given the weather and everything they're probably going to be a weekend gun hunter for one literally that whole season's tag is going to fall on a weekend Mm -hmm. but they still hunted and they still bought into the system signing up for what you all do is a whole different story i mean i have an admiration for it right so i mean that's that's where that churn comes in so it's i don't to to say that there's like too many hunters out there blows my mind it's not true well, we're we're below way below maximum capacity and previous historical numbers. We are millions below, right? Yeah. I mean, we are millions below. I want to bring you back to a point that you said and how you expand on it. So, if you have a new hunter, you have a spot you want to take him. What would be your expectation of that new hunter moving forward that wants to hunt that spot? The, the best thing you can do is to show them how to find a spot. You're really not doing them any favors to be like, all right, let's walk in here with a blindfold on and I'm going to unveil this right. and, you know, or, or like take their map or whatever it is. Like there's no, no benefit to trying to keep anything secret. And there's honestly no benefit to showing them the spot and saying you can come back here and hunt anytime you want to. Like the best thing, the, you, the biggest reason people don't hunt is uh, first of all, knowing where to go and how to find a spot that how to find a spot is very different from like just being able to drive up, get out of a car and walk to a tree stand or, for you all be able to walk to a trailhead you know it's it's the understanding of what you're doing hunting is really intimidating i mean to know 
um, you, you're into archery, look at all the variances. You don't just go and buy a bow off the internet and go hunting the next day. I mean, it's a it's a journey. So, uh, which I never recommend that people start with that. I mean, that people some people want to argue with that, and it's like, man, if you know you're going to be dedicated enough, that's one thing. But nobody yeah. knows that. Like for me, I, I would rather you go get a, a, a you know a shotgun and go rabbit hunting or squirrel hunting and do small game first and work your way up to it. Yeah. But for me, the the one this whole thing, if you're going to boil it down to like your spot and how to treat a new hunter, take them out and show them what they're looking for. Show them. And I don't, I don't, I've never elk hunted, so I don't know what y'all look for when you're scouting. Um, I imagine it's like food sources and, you know, the same type of things I would look for with whitetail. Um, imagine they probably have rubs at certain points of the season yeah. and uh, beds and all that stuff. Um, for, for a guy that's listened to as much Cody Rich as I have, I should know more of like how to scout. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, all, like show them the things that you're looking for when you go on an elk hunt. Or if you're hunting muleys, you know, um, w- what are the signs that they should pay attention to? Um, I th- I there are so many, you know, you said it earlier, you ask your guide a thousand questions over that trip. Um, new hunters have that tenfold. And, yeah. and so really just, just opening it up for them to be able to ask questions and to be able to, to learn, I think is the most important thing. Don't even take them to your spot. That's the thing. Like who cares? Just go out and like scout land together. It doesn't have to be your spot. Um, at the end of the day, having an experience that was enjoyable is going to make them want to come back as much as anything. They don't have to go out there and kill a 380 elk. Like the, I think people, people, that's where a lot of that argument is like, well, but what if they come out there and shoot the bull I've been after? It's like, man, they wouldn't care if like you shot it. Like they, yeah. they just want to be there. Uh, yeah. I don't think you should do that. Like to me, like if you take them out, like give that, give them their, I, I have a friend, my, my co-founder, I'm, I'm trying to get him an animal. We went for turkey season. Um, I think he went out five times with me, maybe, maybe, I think it was four or five times. Uh, I've got a podcast on this, a really great show on how to introduce somebody to hunting. I think it's episode 12 of restless native. Hmm. Um, to listen he, to that one. he, he told me, he said at the end of it all, he's like, well, I guess I'm not a hunter and it's recorded. It was on the way back. We we're in the huh. car and I was like, well, you're as much a hunter as anybody. I said, this is, this is what it is. This is like, you don't always harvest something. You, in fact, most times you go out, you won't be, you'll be coming back with this exact feeling. So you need to understand that like, (laughs) there's not, there's not this glorious moment. And see, it's another reason social media has not helped in a lot of ways. People don't talk about the times they're not successful. Garrett, do you know that's why we have the time log? I didn't know that. Well, that was the, that was the inspiration behind it. it was like, why does nobody talk about the times they go out and, and they they didn't harvest something. You huh. know the time log is the most popular thing on Go Wild. Is it? Yeah, because and, and which is really played into what we wanted it to do. People talking about the other parts of their story. I mean the the, the you look on Instagram right now. I'm going to do this just for the sake of an exercise. I'm going to pull up my app <laughs> and I'm on Go Wild. I, I would be up, interested in hearing what the percentage from your guys' analytics are of the actual time logged versus the time logged on success. Um, like, well, we don't track it the way you're talking about yet, but that's coming. So soon we'll, we'll know successful trips versus unsuccessful trips. Yeah. Like 99% um, of people's times, not successful. The 1% is, and that's usually what yeah. you see. 2019 will be the year we crack into that. Um, we've got a lot of cool stuff coming in January in terms of tracking. That's so right now I pulled up Instagram. Funny enough, um, the first, I swear to God, the first uh, seventy percent of the first posts are all people in bikinis, um, <laughs> and I'll I'll let you assume that they're women. That part's true. It's not a bunch of dudes. That'd be you'd question what I'm uh, following at that point. But it's all trophy st- shots, man. Actually, here's a here's a deer humping a dude. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like it's all trophy pictures. There's nothing of a good sunset. There's nothing of uh, the hike. There's nothing reflective on here. It's more chicks in bikinis, and it's more trophy shots. <laughs> I've got Adam, um, Adam Greentree with a hand and a paw print. Some guy caping out a buck. Adam does a good job of posting experience shots. Um, I really respect him. The uh, but but overall, like we're not teaching people 
what it really is. Unrealistic and, expectations is what really yeah. what it comes down to. And that's that's why we. I mean, there's a lot more to our platform than what it seems. Uh, you, I think you told somebody it was the Instagram, uh, like Instagram. It is right now. There's a lot more coming in January. You wouldn't. I guarantee by the end of January you wouldn't say that again. Really? Um, yeah, we've got uh, go out 3.0 hits in January, and it will be a an entirely new platform. We've kind of laid the foundation for what we wanted to do, and we'll we'll begin to really make some leaps and bounds in January on some stuff. But but the the story, like looking at the story, that's why we have the recipes, man. Like it, to tell the other parts of the story, like to bring things full circle, to show the scouting time, to show the hunting time, to show the trophies when you get them, and they save to your profile so you can pull them up nice and easy and show people. But the and then, then you see the recipes. It's just sh- we wanted to have the full cycle of, of being an outdoorsman captured. Hmm. I thought the the posts uh, or the the log time because I don't really log time much because I thought it was to get like because you guys give products away or something or rewards. We do sometimes we'll associate those with uh, time logs. There'll be more of that coming. I mean, there'll be more activity based soon. Okay. The, the the overall hope or, or like the long term vision for time logs like eventually we want to introduce rewards so for you if you shot your bow you know three times you might earn a discount to oh, um, cool. you know a, a bow shop or to uh, certain off a certain type of broadheads or something like that so um, I mean that we're working on that now that's coming I don't care to announce that uh, <laughs> I haven't told anybody that so I guess we've just announced it. Um, <laughs> I've got people that listen to my show all the time waiting on that stuff. And That's then I funny. finally like announce it on your show. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, as far as activity tracking the, that feeds into your score. And I keep telling people this, and they probably think I'm lying at this point, but we really are, um, look using the score in a lot of different ways. It's, it's our validation. It's not, uh, we don't care how many followers you are. Like that's, in no way factored into our algorithm or any of the things that we look at. Hmm. What we look at is uh, your, your thought leadership, which comes from that scoring model. So, you know, when we look at ranking a post and things that circulate through and even finding answers for people and stuff, um, you know, I know if Jonathan Metcalf has logged, I don't know what Jonathan's score is. It's probably closing in on 10,000, if not over. Yeah. Uh, He was just on your buddy's show. uh, Yeah. Royce, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Royce is um, the Bow Hike podcast, yeah. Yeah, he was just on there. But whatever Jonathan's got, it's like you look at that and you're like, oh, okay, this guy logs a lot of time in the woods. I can probably trust his opinion on the matter. I see. Um, you know, that's that's a lot of the goal was to start there. But that'll start to um, – You know, we're always debating on how we're going to use that. I mean, we might start rolling out some exclusive features to people that are have the most active score over the last quarter. You know, it's not just it's not going to be a a set thing. It's it's a living, breathing score that changes all the time. Hmm. That's pretty cool, man. I'm I'm excited to see where it grows. I was talking about it somebody the other day. I'm like, I didn't get on get in on the ground level, but I I I was telling somebody like, I want to grow with it. You know, like yeah. I definitely feel like it's going to be somewhere that you're going to be happy that you were a part of it early. Yeah. I feel like, yeah. and, and I, not to encourage so people that get into it later or anything. That's not the thing, but for a guy that's trying to grow, I think it's a great tool and, and I've used it and I've got like 70 something followers on there and stuff. And is that a lot? Yeah. No, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but the thing is I've seen like, Really, your followers don't even matter as much today. You're building that for the future because the way our platform works today, it's all very open. Like it's an open source platform, like a Reddit. You know, you can go into Reddit and anybody can see anything, and anything can go viral at any time. It's the same thing with our platform. You don't need Cam Haynes' five hundred thousand followers to reach. Like that's what he reaches is those people plus anything in in that explore tab. Yeah. You know, anything that goes viral in that sense. If you post in deer hunting on our app. Everybody that follows deer hunting can see it. It's going to go into like that's your trail mix. That's your what we call the trail mix. It's a news feed. So it's it's a little bit of a different concept to a lot of people who haven't used a platform like Reddit. If you're used to Reddit, it's it's very similar right now. Again, everything is changing. We we have phases that we're working on. We launched uh, phase one with squirrel. We're currently in phase two, which we call fat rabbit. Huh. And uh, I don't know what the clever name phase one apparently was so fast we didn't come up with a clever name for squirrel. <laughs> it was just squirrel. Um, but there, I know phase three was originally slated as turkey, 
So I'm sure that the team will come up with something clever. I don't know why the rabbit is fat either. I really, I guess I should ask more questions around this. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, no, it's fat rabbit. And I'm like, all right, I get it. Cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, as, as all this stuff grows, like your followers will be more important later when the algorithm starts to come into play. As we get more users, you know, that'll become more and more important. But I mean, anybody that's listening to this and hasn't tried it, like it's, it, I, I have seen regular dudes burn up 70 comments on a post. I've seen regular dudes get way more in- engagement on our platform than they do on their Instagram account. Yeah. And uh, frankly, m- me included, most of my stuff that I put on um, Instagram and Go Wild, Go Wild gives me the most inter- it truly meaningful engagement of comments and, and questions. Um, you, you know, upvotes you might get more on Instagram. You might not, but you might. But I always ask myself, like, where are these coming from? Are they bots? Like, are they real people that yeah. I even know? Um, that's that's the difference. I mean, it's meaningful engagement. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you right now, like, my best feedback, I'd say at least 70% of my best feedback is coming for the podcast, is coming back from guys posting log time on your mm. guys' stuff. And then they tell me what they liked about the show, what they got out of it. And I can use that information and gear that towards future episodes because that's what my audience is into. And I I really enjoy seeing when people post, oh, I listened to On Point today. I'm like, hell yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's pretty cool. And then they they say what they liked about it and stuff. And and, and I've gotten more engagement on posts where I ask a question on the podcast. They'll answer it on Go Wild. But typically on – I don't really do that on Instagram at all. Um, Yeah. But I just – I don't know, man. It's a good community. You got something rolling there, and uh, I, j- I think you got something there. I think it's I think it's a great great website or a, a platform. Well, let's uh, – me and you will go ahead and commit to doing a show, if you will, in, in January, and I'll come back and we'll talk through. I, I think I think your users will be especially interested in the thing we're building. And I'll say you as a podcaster, I think I've teased some of the changes that we're making, but – We've got something really cool coming in the podcast realm. I can't remember if that comes out with 3.0 or not. Um, it's either 3.0 or like 3.2. Uh, it, it'll be probably – if 3.0 rolls out early January, maybe mid – I think it's early January. Mm-hmm. And then I would say this will be – in the podcast update will be in like the second or third week of January. So, right on. Um, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff coming. If people haven't tried it, try it out. It's available on Android, iPhone – and uh, you can find me on there. You'll get an you when you sign up. You'll get an email from me. Um, I did not actually send that email personally. I'm not <laughs> sitting there sending every user that signs up uh, be a lot of emails. But yeah. that is my real email that you can reply to if you have questions. I mean, I deal cool. with our users directly. So, well, uh, hey, I, I appreciate you coming on to the show and giving your perspective on yeah. the public lands and the baboons thing. And I think you and I are pretty much aligned. Um, on both on both topics, and it definitely got a little little squirrely on the go wild there when people were misconstruing <laughs> your, your comments. Nah, those, so, those guys are all good. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I thought I we were gonna. I thought we were gonna debate more, but it was pretty much. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that. So. And, well, I just talk so much, I beat you down, and you forget what I actually said. <laughs> well, <for laughs> that's me, my strategy. For me, I've got I've got my own code I live by. Like if I took a guy out bear hunting. Um, last year and he had never shot one and i'm he'd been bothering me he'd been talking to me for about two years online and so i don't usually take people i don't know i don't you know unless i right. don't know you it's just i with guns i i don't even mess with it oh, I well hear you. he uh he'd built enough of a relationship up with me and i felt like i knew him through social media enough to where yeah he can come up i'd been following him he was a you know through all of his posts he was consistent and uh, came up, come up, and, and I'm not saying this like, oh, look at me, but, he, you know, within 45 minutes, we have a bear down. And the deal was, is Mike, I don't care if you hunt this, but you need to coordinate with me when and how and where and what you saw. So I'm not hunting right after you, and I'm not wasting my time. I'm not wasting your time. I know what's in there. And that's just respect. Like, And also, don't bring a bunch of other people in here. Like, if right. I show you somewhere, you're cool to come back in, but you got to coordinate with me. I think that's me. totally fair. Yeah, that's totally fair. Yeah. And that's I, – I, I think uh, I probably did a poor job of supporting that, even though, again, yeah. I did say, like, I agree with Dudley on this part of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it happens in fishing too, man. And Rogan made that point of, like, a lot of guys will get pissed off over the fishing spot, which I think is almost – it's, like, even crazier on a lake. I mean, you've got people everywhere We've on the lake. We've been shot like, at fishing. 
No kidding. On the Umqua, it's a river here. We're still head fishing, and these guys are in this duck boat, and they're parked, like, not even camouflaged. They're just parked in a drift boat on the side of the bank. And uh, we're like, what in the hell? You know, they got in the fish. What the hell are they doing? Well, then uh, we hear duck calls. I'm like, oh, they're duck hunting. That's cool. And we keep driving up the river, you know, and we float down side drifting. And uh, we float down to about where they're at in the river. That's where we float. And this is a well-known area. Everybody does that same float, right? Yeah. And I don't think these guys knew about that or else they wouldn't have parked their boat there. And anyways, anytime we'd get close to their boat, they'd start spraying shells or uh, uh, BBs over our heads. Duck shot. Yeah. It was like, you freaking oh my god that is not fun either that, no like no the, the so sound I, of i've seen that guy. down over your head i've seen that's my spot guy out out on the mm-hmm. river you know i i i had that's my spot moment this year when i was hunting elk we had people we're in elk right like we spooked an elk right here and then 10 minutes later we're waiting for the herd because we beat the herd to where we were going and uh somebody starts falling like big ass trees within 100 yards like you can see the treetops coming down i'm like you got to be kidding me. I'm like, I wanted to go over there and just ream them a new one. I'm like, but I thought it was illegal at the time because it was still fire season. But it turns out mm-hmm. they were legal, and I was pissed off because it was my spot, you know? Like, yeah, I, right. And so I get it. I get it. But it's not my spot. It's public. And yeah. we, we ended up going hunting a different spot and finding different elk. And it's just if you're so worried about that one spot, why haven't you got another one? You know, yeah. like, and I, I talked to a guy this year who, um, I'm like, you know, we, I, I get a little weird cause he's a really good hunter and we hunt kind of the same area. I'm like, you know what? I'll take you to one of my spots first is good faith. And then we can go hunt one of your spots and then we'll just see how that goes. And he's like, dude, I don't care. You can take people back in here. I'm like, what? You're not worried about people over hunting your spots. He's like, if I'm not a good enough hunter and I, that I have to rely on that spot, then I'm not a good enough hunter. I'm like, touche. <laughs> I'm with him. Yeah. I'm, I'm with him on that. I'm not. I'm not saying people should take your spot, but yeah. you know, it's like yeah. the guy's a killer. I don't. I'm not that you know liberal. You know, with my hunting spots, I'm still pretty close mouth about them. But he's above it. I mean, he he's like you know, if that spot gets ruined, I'll find another one. I'm not worried about it. Yeah. I'm like you know what, good for you, man. That, and he's a killer. He is. Yeah. But uh, all right, Brad. Well, let's let's wrap this thing up. And uh, like I said, thanks for coming on to the show. And then I will absolutely come on to yours. Whatever you want to talk about there, I'm, I'm fired up to see where the go wild thing was. Get and you, yeah, I'll get you there in January, man. We'll do a show. I'm, I'm booked up, I think, until then, but we'll, we'll get it done. Awesome. All right, I'll see you all then. All right, thanks, man. <laughs> see ya. See ya. All right, guys, I want to hear from you. What are your ground rules for showing somebody a new spot? What do you expect from them? And what are the no-nos? If I take you to a spot and you take a bunch of other people in there the next weekend, is that a no-no? Or or is that totally cool? Everybody has kind of this unwritten code of ethics thing, but it seems like it's not completely unified among the hunters out there. So I'm just curious, with your super secret spots or taking somebody out hunting, what do you expect from them and what is not okay? Let me know in the comments section with a five-star review. That will get you entered in some of these giveaways that I'm doing. Uh, Mike Batiste and I from the Elk uh, Calling Academy will be doing a giveaway for a couple lessons on there. And if you're an elk hunter, seasoned or new, you're going to learn something from these uh, lessons that Mike gives. He is such a great uh, person to ask questions for knowledge and, and just really speeds up that learning curve and like I said experience, experienced hunters to brand new hunters for elk you're going to get a lot out of those out of these lessons and each one's about a $30 value so uh, looking forward to that and as always guys I'll see you on the next one bye <laughs>